Good morning. I'm Kim McClary, President and CEO of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. We welcome you all to today's program on the Ukrainian people's fight for freedom. Today's event also kicks off our ongoing series, Putin's Gamble, which focuses on the global implication of Russia's war with the Ukraine. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Yevgeny Afinyensky. Yevgeny is the Oscar and Emmy nominated director behind Winter on Fire, Ukraine's Fight for Freedom, which is the focal point of today's program. Winter on Fire was filmed on the ground in Ukraine during the 2013 and 2014 Maidan Revolution. Yevgeny's work also includes Cries from Syria and Francesco, which documents the ongoing mission of Pope Francis. Yevgeny was nominated for an Oscar and Emmy for Winter on Fire. His film won the People's Choice Award for the Best Documentary from the Toronto International Film Festival. He is currently working on another project in Ukraine and has been traveling between the U.S. and Ukraine during the ongoing crisis. We are honored to have him join us today. We are also privileged for Kevin Getz to moderate today's conversation. Kevin has been at the center of the movie research industry for more than 30 years. His firm, Screen Engine, ASI, conducts research for a majority of all the movies and TV shows that are tested and widely released in America and around the world. He is the author of the recently released best-selling book, Audienceology, How Moviegoers Shape the, the Films We Love, from Simon and Schuster. He's also active in the community and we sincerely appreciate his service as a board member of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. Just a quick update for our audience. I know you're all gonna be wanting to submit many, many questions for today's program. The moderated conversation will last for about 30 minutes and then we'll open the session to audience questions. You can type your questions into the question box on the right-hand side of your screen and our digital producer, Claire Krillitz, will appear on camera to facilitate the Q&A. Now, it's my great pleasure to invite Yevgeny and Kevin to join the webinar. We are all so looking forward to the, your review of this film. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. And Yevgeny, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to do this. I've had the pleasure of meeting you now twice, once in person and once on the phone. And and I really admire you very much. And what a beautiful movie that you created. Uh, and, and I want to say that Netflix was kind enough to uh, put it for everyone's consumption on YouTube uh, in an effort to educate people of what's going on now. And many don't know that, in fact, the Winter on Fire really brings to light that the war started in the winter of late 2013 into 2014. That was the beginning of the current war. Uh, and we can say that it's actually February 2014 because uh, Maidan is 2013-2014. So literally after the winning of Maidan, if you will look at the 27th of February, 27th of February 2014, that's where the annexation of Crimea kind of starting. And that's basically the starting point of the current war but nobody knows about that. And to know that is to have an even greater appreciation for Ukrainian people, for the Ukrainian people, and for, the, uh, for what they've had to endure over these last uh, several years. This is not something that has just occurred for the last 50 days or, you know. And can you speak about what that has meant to you uh, as uh, as someone who comes originally from Russia and uh, your relationship with the Ukrainian people? You know, it's interesting because when I was traveling uh, last times in Ukraine, since the war started, every time I've been stopped by the soldiers, by the military units, and you're showing your American passport where it says Russia, born in Russia, in my Russian name, it gives so much suspicion to them, despite every Ukrainian knows my movie. And in a second, I'm opening my cell phone and showing that I've been with them on Maidan. I've been with them 
and I created this movie, until that it's so much suspicion and it just tells you how big is the gap between two nations that have been once uh, brothers and sisters. It's, it's a disaster that created by, by one person. And I guess that's when we're talking about the personal thing. That's what personal for me. I have many friends in Russia. I have many friends in Ukraine. And today I can see how the hate been created. And it's not will be repaired in a one generation or two. It will take quite a long time. Indeed, indeed. And you know, it's easy to focus on Ukraine right now, but I first want to bring us to discuss the movie itself. What I found so intriguing about it and hard to, you know, as a, as a person who works on movies, I'm always thinking about how did they do what they did? How did you, how did you shoot so up close and personal? Was that you on camera? Did you alternate using the camera right up to the battle lines? How did that work? Listen, today's technology with the cell phones, with um, every possible the gadget, you're able to be presented in the front lines. Even today, when we're filming, we're still there. Even Ukraine have a martial law, we're still filming on the front lines. Now, during Maidan period, I realized that to make a story, comprehensive story about what's happened on the ground, you need a coverage. And as director, usually having a lot of coverage when you're working with the actors in a documentary coverage in that specific case is really important. So I engaged everybody whom I met, whom I saw on Maidan, whom I met, who were filming. And literally, if you will look at the credits, you will see 28 different filmmakers. Contributing. Exactly. And, and so you, you actually gave, said, you actually were saying, here's my cell number, text me your footage, or did you? Was, did you no, 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 I was, I was literally exchanging numbers. I was uh, making contact. I was engaging them in the project, exactly like I'm doing it right now. You can tell the story of revolution, of war, by using one camera. It's impossible. It's impossible if you want really to explain this complicated story to the people. You always need to have so much sources, which are usually engaging in every movie that I do. And I was involving so many sources in this project, being on the ground, feeling this, observing this, learning this, but in the same time, trying to capture as much as possible through all these fascinating people who were also there with me. And you know what, there is a say, to raise a child takes a village. To make a movie takes a village. And in that case, to tell a comprehensive story of revolution takes a village. And I found this village of collaborators and creators who wanted to tell this story to the bigger world. And that's how we did it. You know, Yevgeny, you, you, you have that one moment in particular, I mean, there's so many moments, but when you actually witness someone dying, um, which is a worker who is going in to help an injured um, comrade, compadre, however you want to call it, pulling that person out and getting shot himself, and you see him struggling and dies, I think, on camera. Um, were you, was that you taking that footage? Or? No, I was there. I not took this footage. I know the filmmaker who was next to me who did this footage. But yes, I'm familiar with all these shots. That's eventually contributed to my post-traumatic syndrome. Sure. But uh, you know, that's not my footage, but I was there. What did you learn as a filmmaker, principally from making this movie? You know, a, it's interesting because as the Russian kid who was studying in uh, 1980 in school, I was learning principles of revolution and principles of revolution by Marxism Leninism, by Marx and Lenin. And we were always talking about what were the principles of 1917 revolution that happened in Russia. What was interesting, none of these was actually present in Ukraine. 
In Ukraine, I saw rich and poor, young and old, every social class presented on Maidan side by side, supporting each other. For the first time in history, I saw different leaders of different faiths side by side praying with the people without trying to bring people into the religious groups or kind of bring them into the church. No, they were just the spiritual present on Maidan. It was fascinating. I never saw in Jerusalem, and I'm as a Jewish boy was raised in, in Israel, this ability of collaboration between different faces. This interface dialogue was blowing mind. Same like the beginning of Maidan, when the students were saved, sheltered by the church. Students who are technically not related to the church were sheltered and saved by the church. For me, all these elements were like not from this world. And I think seeing all these things, seeing the ability of what unity can bring, it's allowed me to reevaluate a lot of values, a lot of things what I saw in our world. And I think learning process was that unity can prevail, that we as the people, we as the people have the power, not the government. They as the people came together and brought the change. It's like in our constitution, we are the people. At the end of the day, we are the people who can bring the change and they were there and they brought the change. Now, what is also impo important to admit that they were fighting for the democratic values. They were fighting for democratic values that we actually not cherishing. This lesson makes to understand that to lose democratic values, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, human rights is easy like this. But to gain, it's always a price of life. It's always with the blood. And for, for us in the United States, I think we lost kind of ability to cherish this. We lost ability to kind of take, we are taking things for granted. And I'm talking as American because I'm 23 years here. So for me, I'm cherishing this because if I was right now in Russia, I was dead already or I was in prison with their new law. And for me, I think these values that I brought from Maidan and learned these lessons are really important. And you know, that's what, yeah. when I was, um, I flew into New York City on 9-11. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually was one of the uh, early planes that landed uh, and I was there for nine nights. And that was the first and only time in my entire life that I felt a national a nationalism, a kind of coming together uh, where class and race and ethnicity and all of those things were put aside while we all chanted and sang God bless America at certain times. And there was something so beautiful about it. We have so gotten away from it in this country. Your film helped for me bring that back, the sense of nationalism and unity uh, and how a people can come together. That really resonated for me. And I wanted to thank you for that. Thank you. And I think for me, it was the same lesson. The unity, unity, unity. And uh, you can always see that United Nation, nation that been united around any catastrophe, any desire to bring change, they will win. We are unfortunately divided. They're not United, uh, United States of America. They're divided States of America, specifically after the uh, last administration. We are divided. We have a huge gap between different groups. For the first time, I think we feel how impactful in today's world's camera and can be truly a true weapon. Camera is a weapon. And we're seeing this. Truly... Doesn't lie, does it? Doesn't lie. Yeah. You know, when I was doing Christ from Syria, one of my main characters in Syria, who was the voice of Syrian revolution, Abdel Basit Sarut, who was assassinated in 2019, he said, camera became a weapon. And truly, you know what we can see for the last 10 years, Russia, who was using camera to brainwash and create the society that today 
allowing this war happened and can even justify this in their mind that we just, what, cap we just captured the, the the words of of outright genocide uh on camera audio and i think some video uh where about when they went in to just kill these civilians and said they're civilians just shoot them just shoot them i mean to hear that in 2022 is so i don't know kevin we interviewed <laughs> women who just been evacuated from mariupol and uh, she's a mother and it will be in my new movie and she said that the biggest fear for her was to be raped not to be killed to be raped because they know that women been brutally raped and then murdered in ukraine it's a way of humiliate people but it's also a type of the weapon that russia is using against the civilians which is horrifying it's hard to understand that we are in 20, uh, 21st century right now and that's what's happening but if we will look at the analogy 1812 we had napoleon we're talking about 200 years ago and napoleon tried to take over the euro here is the monster and here is the dictator and he tried to took over the euro we're going 100 years later 1939-945 hitler again monster dictator trying to create his desire to take over euro same thing i guess for this century we have putin who trying to desire do his desire to take over the euro and i think if people still don't understood that it's not about ukraine it's about europe and ukraine is just a shield towards poland towards baltics towards moldova towards many other countries that are in europe and the question where the point that he either will be killed like any other dictators napoleon Hitler, or where the point where the something will happen to him or something will happen in this war well Zelensky, did, i don't know if you saw 60 minutes last night uh was uh extraordinarily articulate especially under these circumstances and mentioned that you know the world has a responsibility and he, he he was asked is putin to blame and he said he's one of the people to blame that and i kind of thought about that statement and went back to your movie again and said it 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 made me think of why you why 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 did we people not rally behind ukraine in 2013 and 14 like they did now why did it take this many years to become the crisis that it was when it's been going on for this many years kevin when maidan happened in 2013-14 how many segments on cnn and cbs you had or in bbc not many not many i can tell you cnn maybe did on maidan two or three cbs had one or two BBC. exactly so at the end of the day, it's a media who had their interest. Now, when Crimea happened, by the way, also after Olympics in Sochi, same like right now, Olympics in Beijing, uh, Putin have tendency to start it after Olympics. Uh, you know, Crimea happened and uh, all what we did is sanctions. And sanctions that were by this time were nothing nothing because each country have interest and we are allowing this happens under the pretext that it's not will happen to us you know what is interesting let's take a lesson in history in 1939 molotov on behalf of russia and reagan trop signing a deal which allows nazis to make feel for russians that russians are safe in the second world war and Nazis can take over Poland. So Russians allowed to take Poland by Nazis. Now, Russians had their agenda. They were thinking they're secure. But unfortunately, not. We learned about this in 1941, when from Poland, Nazis attacked Russia. 
In today's situation, why I bring in this? We're all thinking, okay, we will be doing businesses with Russia, so we are safe. It's not will happen to us, but it is. It is. It can happen tomorrow anywhere in the world. I will give you a crazy example that will blow your mind. Please. The beginning of Maidan in 2013 was a peaceful demonstration of the kids' students. The peaceful demonstrations in 2020 of BLM. In Instead of Kyiv, in Kyiv, yes, in Kyiv, yes. Same peaceful demonstrations we had here in 2020 when BLM started. In both scenarios, the clashes with police were because of the infiltrations of provocators in both things. So provocators infiltrated in Kyiv in a students in students teams and initiated fight with the police, which police brutally basically beat it. The students. They actually planted provocateurs in there, didn't they? Yes. Because I saw that in your movie. Yes. Yes. Same we got here. During BLM, I had many friends who've been there. And I remember how they all been beaten because mm. some people initiated fight with the police. Mm. Exactly like in Ukraine. Okay, let's say that's circumstance number one. But all over the sudden, in Ukraine, immediately at the beginning of Maidan, they started to take historical monuments down just to blame the history. Do we cut it here in US in 2020? Yes. A lot of historical monuments went down. It's like some kind of a scenario in two different countries, but it's written by one writer. Then let's go to the next step. President Yanukovych, President of Ukraine in 2013, calling to President Putin and, and President Putin advising him to bring army forces into the Kiev to literally quash the protesters, which Yanukovych is doing. President Donald Trump in 2020 calling to President Putin and same day National Guard was brought into the cities and we all saw what's happened in DC specifically. So how come almost seven years later, same scenario, absolutely same, same scenario. scenario, same scenario, absolutely same scenario happening. It just shows you that none of the countries is protected. It can happen anywhere in the world. And that's why I think we who are sitting and absorbing Ukraine from here and thinking, no, it's too far for us. No, it's never will happen. No, it can happen. It can happen anyway. I think that's what you, I was just gonna ask you a question about what you want us to take away from your movie. And part of it is to document and have the world see, this is what began, what we now see is so imminent and urgent right now, but also the message that this in fact can happen to any of us. Yep. Yep. And, and that is a very, very important issue to bring forward. Your parents must have had a great influence on you, or your upbringing must have been such where you, I mean, I know you came from, uh, in Israel, you, you directed like 30 musicals and operas. We have a similar, we share a similar background in that respect. Uh, but you then really became very socially conscious and and you 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 done work that really is there to enlighten i suppose what is the spark in you that is making you motivated to do this kind of work this is we know there's not a tremendous amount of money in documentary filmmaking so clearly something else is motivating you tell us about that you know, I think what is interesting, I saw how my storytelling can impact lives of the people and change. I think that's what motivates me. Can you be more specific about just how that happened, how that would have happened? You know, I saw how Winter on, uh, some of my previous movies and then Winter on Fire became kind of call for action or sometimes I call it AAA, AAA. Not AA meetings, not Alcoholic Anonymous. How about AAA, the car service to... to, to, to no, 
<laughs> but you know what? It's advocacy, activism, and action. Yes. I think that's three elements that are related to my movies. Advocacy, activism, and action. And that's what I feel almost in every movie that I have. Remember, Winter on Fire in 2016 inspired Venezuela. I saw people screening movie on the streets of Venezuela, Caracas. I saw how in Nicaragua it's affected people. I saw how Lebanon was affected by this movie in Chile, Brazil. I saw in 2019 when I was filming movies the Paul, how in one night in Hong Kong, 40 different places were screening the movie and that's inspired their revolution. It's fascinating to see how you can change lives and bring people together to use the lessons that I found fascinating to use these lessons for themselves. And how young people are the common thread in all of these scenarios, young people are the catalysts. Yes. They're the first out there. And I just think that's a marvelous thing that's in the history of our country. I think of my youth in Vietnam, the Vietnam War. Uh, I was too young to, to, uh, to serve or to, to um, but I remember the people, the, the signs, welcome home, so-and-so, and, and, you know, rest in peace. So, you know, residents of our community in New Jersey. Uh, and then I saw the marches and the protests, and they were all on the college campuses, of course, and so forth. And, and that's what I found also quite interesting, that Winter on Fire uh, somehow uh, brings the 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 notion forward that young people started this movement and they galvanized the masses. But you know what is interesting when we're looking at the young generation and when we're looking, for example, to the entire Ukrainian government, which is young. Zelensky is young. Uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, with whom I spoke a few days ago, Dmitro Kuleba, is young. Dmitro is like in his forties. Um, very young people. And looking at us in our country, where the leadership mm -mm, needs to really become more younger and more with more energy. I think we literally need to learn that we need to start to groom younger generation of leaders here, because that's what we miss in this country. Young leadership who is patriotic to this country, devoted to this country, and not kind of diving into the corruption and anything else, and the dirty politics. I think but what, what, what we're what is in it? our country is a really younger generation of the leader. What was in your DNA, I guess, your makeup, that, that, that established you to, or, or formed you to get into advocacy, activism, and action? You know, I will tell you, uh, I think hope for the future, ability to bre build some future for the next generation, specifically that I have seven months son right now. And I think that's, thank you, that makes me to try to build something for him and for this next generation. I'm not a politician. I'm not this type of the. Oh, but you are a galvanizer, and you are a, you are a, a effective. I mean, you know, I, just let's mention another movie that you've been working on and have worked on uh, for the past many years uh, on um, on the Pope, and uh, and in fact, you dined with the Pope just last week. I was with him for two hours, uh, spending time discussing the Ukraine, trying to see what is possible. So the average person who's an activist, uh, and or somebody who's 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 uh, into uh, a filmmaking, etc., doesn't often get an audience with the Pope. So that is this very special alchemy of Yevgeny. I think it's about two hearts of. Two people who are trying to solve two hearts. I'm as much as he is the leader of the world, as much as he is the leader of the Catholic Church, 
I see in him as fascinating role model and a humanitarian. And yeah, but how did you get in there? <laughs> you know, I mean, you're a uh, nice Jewish boy. You know, um, it's interesting because when I started to do the movie about Pope, the Vatican did want you to give me access to him, and the Vatican never gave access. I, I know, I realize that. That's so, you know, don't be modest here. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot of hard work. I think through the period of time that I was working on a movie, Francis was learning about me and I was learning about him. And we both were building this bridge between us. And today it's like the most remarkable bridge connection, like two human beings. Two people who deeply care about the world, and uh, like I said, I was with him, and we were trying to think what possible to do for Ukraine, what possible to do for the refugees. What? What did you come up with? You will. You. I can't announce this. It's. It's still in his hands, but he's doing a lot of things, and one of the things you can see is the plaque that next day was presented to entire world. Something that is important to me. Something that was I brought from inside Ukraine because I left Ukraine on Monday and Tuesday I came to see Pope Francis. And I think that was really important for me because this flag was with me and my team everywhere, including oh. Ukraine and every place. Oh. This, this flag is the history of Maidan, history of nation. And for me, it was important that Pope Francis will have a Ukrainian soul and heart in this flag that oh. was standing with these people and uh, that he can pray for their um, again you hear this from Jewish boy that he can pray for them for the peace for the victory and uh, we were talking about different things and you will see in his actions he's trying he's trying his diplomacy he's trying his prayer he's trying his solidarity with Ukraine and I admire him he's an amazing fascinating role model you, you, who cares about so many things, yeah. I, I, I'm curious because you talk about how we, the, the Ukraine people have rallied together and you've never seen anything like it. Why aren't, and as a Russian man, you can speak to this as a Russian, former Russian citizen, what, why aren't the Russian people uh, galvanizing and coming together to demand an end to this terror? I think it's fear. I spoke with a lot of Russian people, specifically for my movie, and it's fear. It's really fear. I think Russia, for the last 10 years, had so much different laws that are making people to fear for their lives and for their beloved ones. Even seeing how mothers, Russian mothers, afraid to ask for the bodies of their own kids who've been killed in Ukraine. Mothers whose sons been in a captivity in Ukraine, they afraid to ask for them to be exchanged and back to Russia because they have a fear, fear against the government, against the machine of the government, against the institution of security that can easily throw you into the jail or kill you. And I think that's the fear. What can we do as citizens of this country of is there anything that we where we can truly make a difference or is it is it just think, bigger than us you know it's it's uh listen it's it's hard to understand our government i understand that our president holding a lot of things and they're afraid to be involved into the war but technically we are involved into the war entire world United States, European countries, we all giving support. We all giving weapons and money. So technically, indirectly, we are involved in this war. Now, what Ukraine needs is to close sky. Maybe not with our soldiers, but with the jets that we can provide. We really need to understand that it's a war of the entire world against the system of Russian president in Russia. We need to- I guess I don't understand when, when they talk about 
uh, that by sending planes and closing the airspace, that will somehow, um, that's the first or next step to a nuclear invasion. I don't quite see that connective tissue. Can you articulate why the Americans yeah. and other allies are saying that? Putin threatened with the nuclear uh, nuclear war. But I will tell you something, what I what I already see, first of all, it will be chemical. And I think he will use chemical weapon like he used in Syria. You can see it in my other movie, really clear. And I think what comes next is the usage of chemical weapon because chemical weapon, hard to trace, but it brings fear to the civilians and makes damage to the civilians. And it's really something that can bring a lot of fear to the people because out of nowhere, you are suffocated, you can't breathe, you have uh, some kind of... Uh, issues with your skin you can uh, it's 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 a tactical gear to make people to feel and then chemical is dissolves dissolves fast on a specific different types of the weather it dissolves sometimes even more faster than usual and that's actually probably the next step for putin i doubting that it's going to be nuclear because putin need to understand that he eventually can destroy entire country where he lives and uh, pushing nuclear toward the world the world will respond so yes he may try but i think it's but it's barking but not biting and i will tell you another thing that when he was uh, in the middle of conversation it was that we are responsible it was your sentence that we in certain points responsible yeah we are responsible if you will look at Barack Obama, when he said to Assad, if you will cross red line with the chemical weapon, we will act, but he not. So that allows dictators to do whatever they want and not being punished. Because they were not following through on our threat. Yep. And I, and I will tell you something. That same thing with Putin. Putin saw that the world not reacted to his invasion of Crimea, what it was, sanctions, but sanctions that not did anything to any of them. Almost every head of the e parliament have a child who lives abroad. Uh, Lavrov's daughter lives in the United States. So there are kids living in, in different countries. Did they been uh, touched? No, by the sanctions. Right now, we're starting to talk about this on a stages where we see in horrible situation from the war in Ukraine 50 days later. But when Crimea happened, when MH17 happened, when Donetsk Donbass happened, did the world react? It? No, no. We're only right now trying to learn what it is and trying to unite around. Well, well, I'll challenge you on that. Did the world react? Of course the world reacted, but certainly not with the kind of force, I don't know what that even means, that was needed to create uh, the, 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 the threat back to, um, to Putin. So to but, that, I agree with wait, you, but- David, That allows to dictators like Assad, use chemical weapon every month in Syria. And today, nobody paying attention to Syria. Nobody paying attention to atrocities. Now, and this, we don't and know this, what... new, and this new general, oy, this new general uh, appointed now, who was, what did they call him? The, the, the Syrian, you know, he was the... Okay, I know what it's called. Barbarian of Syria, yeah. something so, like that. So at the end of the day, we allowed unprecedented power to these people without punishment. Now, I think in today's world, it is a case study for dictators. I'm sure that China is sitting and observing how the world will react to the, what Putin doing, because China have eye on Taiwan. And if, for example, we will not react and we will not act properly, Taiwan will be next because for every dictator, they can see, okay, world not giving a fuck, good. I can be unpunished. I think what is important is 
to unite and to uh, not allow this happen. Because when Ukraine will be over for Putin, Poland will be next. And then the world will say, oh, give out. Why we not stopped him there? But we had a chance and we not did it. Same oh. like Barack Obama had a chance to prevent spreading chemical weapon, which happens in Syria when he threatened uh, when he threatened us. So again, we are sometimes afraid to act, but then the fruits of the disaster comes towards our doors. And that's a great way to segue us into uh, our audience questions because we've moved into an area that I know so many of our members are interested in and particularly getting your take, having just been there last week, but also your um, you know, extreme involvement. Thank you so much for discussing this. And uh, Claire, would you mind um, uh, sort of bringing up some questions from our audience? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for that really engaging conversation, Kevin. We have lots of questions from our audience. So we'll try to work through as uh, as many as we can. But before we dive in, I just want to thank my colleague, Rachel Kenderdine, who's behind the scenes with us today, uh, who had a really instrumental uh, role in bringing this conversation to all of us. So thank you, Rachel. Um, so the first question is, the central narrative pre-invasion was that Russia would overtake Ukraine swiftly. After watching your film and seeing the unity and fearlessness of the Ukrainian people in their fight against Russian influence, why do you think anyone thought Russia would overtake Ukraine easily? I think for Putin, who took Crimea easily and took the next England bus, having pro-Russian kind of narrative inside of these territories, he was considering that it will be very fast. And in the same time, it's not going to be any kind of uh, reaction from the bigger world. Remember, from the day one, the world, European Union, America, not were ready to do anything for Ukraine. And it was stated that we are not getting involved. It's between Russia and Ukraine. But then, days passing, and uh, German started to send them uh, military aid. Uh, America started to give them. Europeans started to give them. So that was something that unexpectedly surprised for Putin. And many more, and many more, and many more. Now, another situation that Putin miscalculated, Putin promised something when he came to Crimea. Putin promised them increase of the salaries and boosting the economy in Crimea. A lot of territories around Crimea on a, a Ukrainian side, Kherson, for example, was one of the cities who in 2014 was quite aiming Russia, towards Russia, pro-Russian. They were literally uh, looking towards the direction of Russia and not towards the direction of uh, entire Ukraine and integration into EU. It, is, it, it was there. And it's interesting how many cities around, including Kherson itself, they were observing how all the promises of Putin on the Donetsk, Donbass, and uh, specifically Crimea not worked. Kherson, who is not far from Crimea, they were observing how, yes, he increased salaries, but in the same time, economy sinked. Ukrainians stopped coming to Crimea as the tourists. Russians, who saw increase of the prices because the salaries went up, so the prices went up. So Russians who saw the prices went up realized that for shitty service in Crimea, for the high prices, we rather go for the better service to Italy or Turkey, pay same money and have a good service. So technically, neither the Russians, neither the Ukrainians went to be a tourist in Crimea. So the economy that was built by the tourism sinks completely. Now, many cities like Kherson and others were observing this. So the promises of Putin about boosting the economy not worked. Tourism that was promised not happened. So people were disappointed. Disappointed with the promises that never came through from the person who technically under these premises invaded them. So that allowed to many Ukrainians turn back to Russia and become Ukrainians in their heart, mind, and soul. They really, in 2014, were considering kind of 
pro-Russian regulations back, but in 2022, they became completely Ukrainians. They re-evaluated their values and they were looking towards be one Ukraine together, which we're seeing right now. We're seeing how in same Kherson, who in 2014 was completely different, Mariupol was completely different. We see how people marching with the Ukrainian flags against the tanks, against the Russian tanks. So that was a huge miscalculation. Now, did the, another, Ukraine, did the Ukraine have a military pre, uh, force? Ukraine have military force, yeah. Did they have an organized and strong military force before this? They are, they are, but remember, they were for eight years inside of the war that was already exist for the entire world the war started kind of they think in the war started on 24th of february this year but no the war started end of february 2014 and that's when the war started with the crimea and then with the rest and bus and so, some other things so that was another miscalculation now also putin's miscalculation was that he can literally enter Ukraine from four different points and uh, it was a surprise and he can take over. No, he not realized that Ukrainians had experience to fight in the Second World War and uh, it's uh, not going to be easy. His army not been in a war for a long time, which was quite a big shock for them to go into the war all over the sudden. And I think all these small points of miscalculation brought to the big catastrophe that the war today is already at the day fifth and the new general that was appointed instead of Shaigu right now pulling out of Kiev and instead of four points of direction to take over Crimea or over the Ukraine they trying to regroup and go one by one taking cities one by one I think that's how the mind is working right now for the Russian generals because they're understanding they can't spread too much because they don't have this. Putin, like a week ago, I think, recruited 60,000 new soldiers from the Russians. So recently, they, I think recently retired ones or something. Still, 60,000 yeah, uh, pieces know, of the they're, they're, they're running out of, of they're running out of, of troops. Meat. Kevin, 60,000 pieces of meat for the bullets. Well, come on. 100%. Claire, you want to jump in with another question? Yeah, so you sort of mentioned, um, you know, some of this about how the West and other countries really stepped in and that wasn't expected. Um, but combining a few questions from our audience here, um, you know, there have been countless invasions globally. Um, someone brings up, you know, what happened in Aleppo and how the world didn't really seem to care about all the violence that was there. So why has this particular invasion um, garnered such global response and importance? I will tell you something. At the beginning, Syria was also uh, having a lot of a lot of exposure when things started with Syria. But slowly it went down. And today, if you're looking at Syria, it's already 11 years. I am telling you that Ukraine had a lot with the invasion or oh, in the invasion and annexation of Crimea and Donetsk, Donbass, that it's had certain moments in the history with the media, and it slowly went down. Today, everything is about Ukraine, and it's true, because it's a part of Europe. And we're talking about security of European Union, and we're talking about NATO, and we're talking about issues that related to so many countries in European Union. It's a threat to European Union, and of course to us because we have a basis and we have a soldiers there so it is a real threat there now at the end of the day russia not been a friend to united states for quite a long time so i think it is something that really relates to us and i feel that in two three months ukraine will have way 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 less kind of media coverage it slowly will go exactly like the situation with uh, Syria. Remember, I covered Syria. I did a movie. I was one of the people, last people when Aleppo was failing. I was there. We, we filmed there. And I remembered all these things. 
it came into the news and it disappeared. What's the name of that movie for those of us people who would like to uh, watch it? It's Cries from Syria. It's on HBO. Thank you. So I think it is really important to remember that media have its cycles. And uh, today we all pay attention because it's international threat. It's international threat to all our existence and we all involved into this. That's why I think Ukraine is on the news. And it's important, it's important to stop this. And I also want to say something very interesting. I was in Rome and I was talking to somebody who is a quite a big diplomat and uh, he received almost every head of the state. I don't want to mention his name, but he said interesting thing to me over the dinner. He said, Evgeny, if every leader of every country in Europe, and including the United States, will sit together and will compromise in this situation, we may find the solution to this peace. But the problem that not much of them wants to compromise, and that's the issue. Because to make a peace, to find a peace to this situation, it's the only way to seat all leaders and to find compromise together, that each one needs to compromise. Thank you. Yeah. So Kevin mentioned that you were just uh, in Ukraine recently. So, I mean, I think it would be really awesome if you could just let us know some of that experience and, and what it's like there and what the Ukrainian people are, are feeling and experiencing. Um, just any thoughts on the sort of on the ground perspective? I think Ukrainian people do expect in us to to help to stop this war because they're feeling that they are at the end of the day trying to shield with their lives, with their homeland. Just to be clear, Americans or the West or what are you talking about us? I think America and the West together because we are all together in that case, Kevin. It's uh, It starts with America because I think the uh, NATO countries and specifically EU, they're looking towards Biden, towards President Biden. And I think they all expecting us to do a first step in this case. Now, but the Ukrainians understanding that they are the shield towards the euro and that Putin will go to Poland and other countries. They understanding. They understanding what we not seeing from here. We not seeing this immediate threat to Poland. We not seeing immediate threat to Baltic republics, which are part of EU, by the way, or some other European countries, which Putin already almost claimed as his. So I think there is a reality that the world still not woke up and that Ukrainians do see this in different way and expecting us to act and not to discuss. When Bucha and Erpain were dis uh, shown to the world, for two days, Secretary Blinken and President Biden were talking about investigation of these crimes. But guys, these crimes will continue if we will not stop this war. So of course, these crimes will be investigated, but till we will not stop this war, it will be more crimes and more crimes and more crimes. So when you come into the doctor, doctor trying to give you a treatment to tackle the root of the illness and not discuss the symptoms and not to say, express his condolences that you have a pain under the right shoulder and it's maybe something and something and something. He trying to cure the roots of the illness. And same here. We need to stop talking and do things. What do we I, need to do yeah. specifically? Now, we already are giving them weapons every day, et cetera. Uh, I know you mentioned the no-fly zone, but what does that lead to? You know, as an American, Ginny, you, 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 you come to the perspective of you have, you're not you know, coming from it in a naive way. You are extremely educated on all sides. What do we need to do? I think we do need to find a way to give the planes without pilots that will give them ability to cover the sky. I think we really need to provide it through third party or something because 
You're absolutely right. We're giving them weapons. So what is the difference when we're giving them a certain military equipment A, and right now we will give them certain military equipment B? Yes, it's maybe on a bigger scale, but at the end of the day, if this can prevent or stop this war or minimize the casualties of the civilians, we need to act on that. Yes, we fear that we are entering into the World War III, but it is a World War III. You just said it, Kevin, we're giving them weapon, but do we giving them right weapon to protect their civilians? Not. We're giving them something. Okay, okay, okay. If you will pay attention from the beginning of this war, we increased from weapon A to weapon B to weapon Z. We drop kind of slowly growing in a different types of the weapon, more and more kind of military tough gear. But why are we not able to go from A into Z immediately when it's nece necessary? Why we need to allow so much casualties on the ground? And I think that's what is the simple task, to allow them to cover the sky so there is no much casualties and to show that A, Putin at the end of the day will choke himself with all this invasion and he need to find the solution how to sit with the bigger guys. Because that's the dictators. When they haven't presented access to the power and nobody able to slap them in the face and say, hey, stop Keep this. going, keep going, keep going, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Claire? <clears throat> yeah, so on the conversation about Putin, um, a lot of people are in the in the questions have questions about you know the fact that 80 percent of russians believe putin there's all of putin's propaganda and you know just control his complete control over information so is there anything that could change the minds of the russian people against him and is there any hope that at any point in time they will have an accurate depiction of what's going on the problem is for last 10 years, the propaganda machine was really working so good and brainwashing people. Putin playing the Goebbels book. Joseph Goebbels in 1939 said, take a lie big enough, repeat it over and over, and it becomes truth. It's a book, playbook of Joseph Goebbels, head of propaganda of Hitler. Same Goebbels said, truth is an enemy of the state. These two main rules, been used by Assad, by many other dictators. This is from where we in the United States learned the terminology that called fake news. It's exactly how certain narratives were created in our country even, by the same playbook that we learned and certain leaders learned and certain people in our government learned from the people abroad like Putin. Now, Putin for the last 10 years, since in 2011, the Duma brought the law about foreign agents, they started to really hunt activists, journalists, and for the last couple of years, it became so impossible. For example, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, for the last couple of years, which is American entity that is, uh, exists abroad, and trying to spread the democracy and the true uh, journalism from everywhere in the world. Radio Free Year, Radio Liberty was bankrupt with the fines by Russian government and the office was closed. I have huge issue these days with the uh, general counsel of Radio Free Year, Radio Liberty, because uh, in my opinion, uh, they not exactly uh, focusing on the long-term journalism, and I really feel uh, bad that the entities that our government and our Congress supporting in terms of provide the democracy abroad, focusing only on a day by day journalism and not trying to initiate more long term journalism like uh, we as a filmmakers offering. But Radio Free Europe was literally bankrupt. Now, if you remember, in the beginning of this year, Duma came with the law about 15 years. Uh, in a prison that anybody who will call the special operation that Putin initiated in Ukraine as the war, the, for the word war or no war, you simply can go for 15 years in prison. 
So they literally putting people into the prison for just saying war or saying no war. People living in fear in Russia. The rest of the population living under their zombie TV, which is the only source of the information that they have, because internet is kind of not exist. They have VPNs, uh, virtual stuff, but still majority of the people, they just glued to the one source and that's the Kremlin TV. I had, uh, I interviewed Marina uh, Obsadnikova, the lady that jumped with the poster into the news. We had a long conversation with her over two hours. And Marina said that everything what Channel One was receiving was coming from Kremlin. Now, I will give you an interesting example. To get to the broadcast booth from where the news broadcasted, you're going through the four circles of the military. That's how the government protects the broadcasting booth from where news broadcasted. Literally, she had access to three circles of this military, but not for force. She said, literally, inside of the booth, in front of the person who is talking, telling you news, you have a policeman who's sitting and watching the person. That's the price of this, the news and how news protected in Russia, because this news coming from Kremlin. That's how it is in Russia. Wow. So, wow. yes, the people in Russia, they're either living in fear or under propaganda. Now, sanctions, let's go back to sanctions. Sanctions hitting, again, they're supposed to hit the elite, but eventually they destroy the economy of Russia. And who's suffering and suffocated? Middle the people. class. The and people. Poor. Correct. And they starting to think, maybe Putin right. Maybe the West is so bad and our leader is good and he fighting the bad people and we all need to suffer with our leader and that's actually playing for the benefit of putin because the suffocated nation of russians starting to rethink and follow putin because they're thinking that we are the bad people and that's the truth and reality well, with that god uh save us all uh and uh let's pray for um that doesn't happen and let's pray for ukrainian people and uh eugenie uh thank you so much i'll invite kim back on because i know she wants to say a few words to thank everyone but uh on my on my perspective uh this was very interesting and you're a, a really impressive human being and thank you Yevgeny, as Kevin said, we are so appreciative of your insights into this crisis in Ukraine and your personal insights help our audience better understand the complexities, the history, and the potential for the future. So we so much appreciate your time. And Kevin, you are wonderful to moderate yet another program for us. Thank you. So it's my very pleasure, Kim. It's my Thank pleasure. You. Thank you so but much. I want to I want to pitch his film one more time. If you haven't already watched the film Winter on Fire, we have placed the link in the chat on that control panel on the right hand side of your screen. So we encourage you to watch this film. It is phenomenal. And Netflix recently posted the film on YouTube as a resource for those looking to learn more about Ukraine's past and how it ties into today's conflict. Uh, to our members and supporters joining us today, we're so grateful for your attendance. Please check out our website. We have some terrific in-person and live stream programs coming. Up, so check us out today. Thank you both so very much. This was a terrific program.